essentiality, essentialness, the word that's key in the shutdown. Essential businesses have been allowed to remain open. What makes something essential? Today, we'll first talk about why we need to actually define this word essential. We'll take a survey of some essential businesses. Then we'll talk about what essentiality means. The rationale, the reasoning, the logic behind something being essential. Modifying factors, whether it makes something essential or not. Consequences of something essential. And then finally, the application to the current pandemic situation, how everything is opening up, in particular, Governor Newsom's roadmap to reopening. Why do we need to define essential? So we don't commonly use the word essential. We say things like, I think it is essential. No, not in America. Maybe in England, it is essential that I go to the market today. We say need here. I need to. I need to make it to the store before it closes. A child may complain to his parents, Mommy, I need that new phone. Everybody else at school has it. In Asia, you see lots of people wearing masks. My friend called these the ninjas in Vietnam. Apparently, you have to wear a mask. And if you're a woman, you basically cover everything up to protect yourself from the sun. Actually, my wife made me wear a mask too. If you look, there's men wearing masks as well. I need a pee. When is something an actual need versus just a want? This word need, this word essential, it's vague. It's poorly defined. If you just think about consequences purely, then almost nothing is essential, right? If you need a pee and you don't have a place, you'll just wet your pants. Your batter won't explode. You'll just release it before then. What's the big deal? So I guess the definition's a bit more complicated than just saying, oh, are you going to die? In the current pandemic situation, many shops are closed. Oh, except for, quote, essential businesses. What is an essential business? Well, you could look at the website. For California. So there's lots of things listed as essential, as you see here. And it actually varies among different states. For example, Delaware allows floors to deliver. Arizona golf courses were classified as essential and they remained open. Pennsylvania closed liquor shops, the only state to do that. They're non essential. Actually, I think India closed them too. I was in Singapore recently. And I found that their definition of essential also changed. Initially, manicurists, pedicurists, massage therapists, they were allowed to stay open. I commented to my friend, doesn't that seem sort of dangerous? I mean, not even talking about whether it's essential or not, but you're just in such close proximity with people. And then they closed them. And then later, standalone drink shops were ordered to be closed starting April 22nd. Thus, April 21st is a very important day in Singapore. April 7th was the day the quarantine lockdown period started. And April 22nd was the day that there was no boba. You can see the long lines. There is even a scuffle that broke out. As for me, what do I define as essential? Well, see, I don't need restaurants. I don't need transportation. I have a bicycle. I need places, though, that sell Doritos and durian. Unfortunately, I don't think those places exist. Because Singapore, you could find durian, but you can't get Doritos. And in America, you could get Doritos, but you can't really get durian. Why do you need restaurants? Sure, you don't know how to cook? Well, guess what we have? Hot Pockets. Part of a complete balanced diet. You know, microwave food is pretty amazing here in America. They have this crisper sleeve. So it makes it crispy on the outside. When microwaves normal make things soggy. Some pizza has this too. My dad even said as long as you only heat up an egg in a microwave for less than 30 seconds, it won't explode. Very good then. You don't need a restaurant. You can go to the grocery store and cook everything yourself in your microwave. The government has been accused of having arbitrary definitions of essential businesses. They change your mind. They waver. They don't even know what they're talking about. Before we 
think about that. I think we have to actually address what essentiality means. Let's look at the rationale, the reasoning, the logic behind declaring something as essential or not. So you see this checklist? It's a checklist that you're supposed to run through for the plane if you're a pilot. Why are checklists important? Because we forget. You don't have to think when you look through a checklist. You just check, 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 read and check. Do you remember that Lion Air flight that crashed the evening prior? The same plane actually had issues as well. And the crew went through the checklist. They went through three separate checklists of what to do. And obviously, they made it. When in time of stress, your memory doesn't work very well. And that's why checklists are important because we just have poor faulty memories. That's why I use my phone to put in reminders. Unfortunately, sometimes I ignore my reminders just like we ignore our alarm that wakes us up in the morning. But I put in a reminder to get a visa for Vietnam when I was going there. You know, it's two weeks in advance. Yeah, I still have time. I'll do this later. Until suddenly I was doing online check-in and then I remembered, oh, I think I need a visa. Not good. You don't need to do it now. You just need to do it sometime. All these little tasks. That's forgetfulness. Many times my mom would nag my dad to get gas. You're low. He's like, oh, come on. An eighth of a tank? That's like plenty. Even when you go down to empty, no problem. Your car has a, this safety measure built. You still have like a gallon or two of gas. That takes you a long time. And if you were to run out of gas, I need gas now. But you know, I didn't need gas when you told me I needed gas half an hour. I just simply didn't need gas. Forgetfulness. We're human. We forget. When we remember, sometimes we just need to do it now. Another thing, quality of life. If you look here at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you'll see that at the very bottom is the physiologic needs, the need to eat. In America, the vast majority of us don't worry about that. And it's a shock when you have to think about those things once again. I was in Zambia for a rotation, and it was very difficult living at the house. It was actually, quote, a nice house. They charged me a huge whopping sum, like 450 or 500 a month, which I thought was crazy for a room in Zambia. There's a lot of things I had to get adjusted to. The toilet seat didn't really stand up. You have to sit down for everything. The screen has a hole in it. The pots and pans are burnt. Food was a difficult thing. I didn't want to cook with this disgusting equipment. But the nearest place to get food was half an hour walk. There were no sidewalks. So I ended up losing weight. I ate a good meal at the hospital. And other than that, I just ate some fruit and yogurt. Malaria pills. You know, it's so annoying. I was there for a month to just put your, that mosquito repellent on you every day, twice a day. Ah, uh, I guess I'm supposed to take malaria pills, but who wants to take a pill every day? Some of them have side effects too. Nobody gets sick here. The people here don't worry about it, right? In medical school, I had a classmate who lived in Africa when he was growing up. His dad was a missionary doctor there. He said, yeah, malaria, just, you just get it. He had it like two times as a kid. It's just life. But guess what? People do die from malaria there. I saw a lady in a hospital, very ill, whose kidneys weren't working, who was on a ventilator. What did she have? Oh, malaria. Oh, malaria? It's actually dangerous. I started taking the pills again my last week of my month there. In the U.S., we have a different quality of life. We expect a different quality of life. People tell me I need to get a haircut. I should shave. I don't think they're actually joking. They really mean it. We're supposed to be presentable. Our cars have to be a certain condition. We have to get smog checks in California. We don't like inhaling the nice perfume of smog, shall we say. We have a standard of living here. It's a real thing. If you go below the standard, life is truly risky. There are suicides here. Lorna Breen, you may have heard about, was an ER doctor from New York City. She committed suicide. Why? Somebody from Zambia may ask. Was she in so much debt and the debt collector was threatening to hurt her family? Were they going to get sold into slavery? Was food in short supply? Of course not. But it's a real thing. Stress, emotional issues. She didn't starve to death. She didn't die of cancer. But all of us would say here that she died because of the hospital, because of her work. Quality of life. That's the reason we live here. It actually matters. And we care a lot about it. Then there's all the behind the scenes stuff. I don't understand a lot about this. I think most of us, I don't know if anybody understands all the things required to keep society working. I think when they go through these things, you know, like in Singapore, you could write to them saying, hey, I'm essential and explain them. They're like, oh, oh, you are essential. I, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Trash collectors. I don't see them. You don't see them. In New York City, they didn't see them either until they went on strike. 
And then all of a sudden, oh, yes, very important. The garbage just piled up, rats collected, had a party, I guess. The people who maintain the chemical factories, or factories in general. India had a big styrene spill. People woke up, and guess what? They couldn't breathe. Uh, the lockdown's over. It's not from the coronavirus. There's this big white stuff hanging over the air. And it was a styrene spill. At least a few people died. I guess they didn't, weren't really sure how to maintain that big bottle of styrene. Codependence. Connectedness. Somewhat related to the last one. But if you want to take your niece somewhere and you forgot her teddy bear, you can't just say, Ah, oh, it's no big deal. No, you better go back and get it. Because without her teddy bear, she will not be happy. She needs her teddy bear. Oil plants aren't running. Oil production is down. There is too much oil. Oil is cheap. How does that relate to meat processing plants? Oh, well, you see, carbon dioxide is produced as a byproduct of ethanol production. In the United States, ethanol production is what we use to supplement oil. But because gas is so cheap, ethanol is not being produced anymore. This carbon dioxide industrial scale amounts is not plentiful. And carbon dioxide is used in meat processing plants for killing animals humanely, for chilling meat, for refrigerant purposes. Uh, okay, I didn't know that. I guess things are connected in ways that who would have expected? Public transit is another one. You may think, I have a car, you have a car. Why do we need public transit? Why is BART still running? There's no money in BART. Well, do you know that not everybody has a car? Some people actually can't get there if they don't have public transportation. And these people may be working essential jobs. So that's sort of some of the rationale behind declaring something as essential. Now we talk about modifying factors that may change what essential means. The most important one is knowledge. See, if you think something's essential, but somebody else knows more, they may not say it's essential and they may be right and you're just wrong. If you look at this, it's the Lord of the Rings, if you remember the undead army that came to fight. Obviously they slaughtered the enemy. But they were fighting for their dear lives before. They were fighting really hard. If they knew the undead army's coming, they would have said, ah, let's just retreat, take it easy. In an hour or so, they'll all be dead. We don't have to do anything. Why am I working so hard when somebody else is just gonna come fix in an hour? Oh, it's because they didn't get the phone call. They didn't check their phone for the text message that was sent saying the undead army is coming. Oh, the, the internet was down? Yeah, that explains it. Sight. We talk about in video games, how you see what somebody else is doing. You see where they're coming from. In the military, we talk about this all the time. It's not technically future, but it is future because you know where they're coming from. You know what to prepare for. That's the future. And there's also past knowledge. When I go to my friend's place, Ryan, I don't ring the doorbell. I just knock on the door. How do I know the doorbell is broken? Well, because I've been there before. But past knowledge, this is important. You've experienced in the past. You know, it doesn't work quite the way it seems. You also know how to fix it. General principles. If you're out in the wilderness, you got stranded at night, it's cold, around freezing, don't have enough clothing, you don't sleep because you'll freeze to death. It's not necessarily true, but it's generally true. If you know this, good, you'll probably survive. If you don't know, you might die. What's essential? Well, it depends on what you know. If you look at these two types of pneumonia, I actually had a patient with this PCP, pneumocystis gyrovecchi pneumonia. And the treatment of choice is Bactrim. It's an antibiotic not commonly used for pneumonia in America. Someone would say, hey, how come you're not treating his pneumonia? And you're like, oh, because it's PCP. You have more specific knowledge. You know exactly what to do. You don't have to rely on general principles, which may in fact be wrong in this case. Our standard antibiotics, ceftriaxone, zithromycin, they won't cover this type of pneumonia. I remember a patient with Parkinson's. He was pretty bad. He couldn't get out of bed. It was very hard to understand him talk. And obviously with Parkinson's that bad, you're just going to die. There's a big decision to be made. Which direction does he want to go? Does he want to give us an artificial opening to his lungs called a tracheostomy? None of us could really understand him. We didn't want to make such a big decision based on some babble we hear because he just can't talk very well. We thought he wanted to just go on hospice, but we weren't sure. Luckily, he had a friend. And we contacted a friend who'd known him for decades and the friend came in, talked to him and explained to us exactly what he wanted. So he did want to go on hospice. I gave him a bag of Cheetos. He wanted a double bag. He wanted to eat. He wanted to just live happily before his life ends, not to linger on. Specific knowledge. Because this friend could understand him. 
when nobody else can because his friend's known him for decades. And in real life, it's not one or the other, not future knowledge versus past knowledge versus specific knowledge versus general principles. It's all a combination. Here's a 12 year old who survived a plane crash and he said he knew that the plane would crash and thus he had to unbuckle his seatbelt. Okay, so I'm not sure he knew the plane would crash, but say he did. That's future knowledge. Then he had to have specific knowledge as well. It depends on how the plane crashes. Yes, in some cases, like the crash in Taipei, it seems like if you didn't have your seatbelt on, you would have done better because you wouldn't have had your seatbelt caught and not be able to get out and drown to death. Then there's a case like the Asiana crash in San Francisco where the girl got thrown out of the plane because her seatbelt wasn't on obviously and she got, well there's two things, one got run over by a fire truck, one got smothered, I don't know. Anyways, you have to have a lot of different knowledge. Another important thing that modifies what essential is knowing how other people respond. This is obviously not something we know, it's not possible to know. If you think of uh, rock, paper, scissors and two children who've never played it. So what are you going to do? No, 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 no. We, we just, we just do this. But I, I need to know what, what are you going to do? No, no, we just have to put it out together. No, but I need to know first what you're going to do. The first kid is actually correct. You do need to know what the person's going to do. If they put out a rock, you have to put out paper. It's the only thing that matters. There was a case that made the news because this bicyclist lost. This lady was walking in London on her cell phone and he hit her and she sued. Well, she was on her phone crossing the street. She honked his horn. It was a loud horn. She definitely heard it. It was 110 decibel. But then instead of moving forward or standing in place, she moved back and he hit her because he thought she would move forward or at least stand in place. He would have wished he knew what she would have done. For me, it worked out the other way. I was hiking in Lufutin and I accidentally kicked down some rocks. It was a steep trail, there's people below me. A few minutes later, after they recovered from the shock of having rocks fly over their head, they yelled at me saying, hey, how come you didn't warn us? I apologized. But actually, I guess it was a good thing. In hindsight, I didn't say anything. If I said something, maybe they would have lifted their head and the rock would have hit them. I don't know how people respond. We just can't know. That's one thing we have to take into account when we define something as essential. And then there's the passage of time. Maintenance isn't very important for right now. It may not be important for a week or two, it may not be important even for months, but it's important sometime down the road in the future. My teeth hurt. I could stand it. But if I don't see a dentist for months, maybe for years, I might get a bad cavity and it might become an abscess and you might get hospitalized and you have to have the maxillofacial surgeons, the dentists come in. You know, they don't like to come into the hospital. They only come in because it's essential. When was it essential? Just right now? Back then? Time changes it. It could be non-essential for a period of time, but after a period of time, it becomes essential. And the last one, consequences. This is the hard one to talk about. What are the consequences if something essential is shut down? We first talk about mortality, dying. My friend always asks me, hey, are you afraid you're going to die? She's very adventurous. She likes to do risky things, in my opinion. I say no. No, I don't think climbing that rock, I would die. She asked, then why don't you do it? And many times I do. It makes it seem less scary. I'm not going to die. Well, okay, well, yeah, I guess I'm not going to die. For most of us, that's a given. The problem is morbidity, a decrease in quality of life. It's a generic term. In the medical field, you say it's like losing an arm, the side effects of chemotherapy, but what are the consequences? And that's where everybody's discussing the economy. I'll leave this to somebody else to talk about, but I don't know what to say. The stock market's doing fine, I guess. Unemployment, people are hurting, but again, people seem to be doing fine. There's not more homeless people as far as I could tell. Maybe it's because of the shelter in place, but I don't think they really care about that anyways. But this is where it gets very controversial. What are the consequences? So now we go on to the actual application with specifics to the California reopening. If you look, there's the requirements for reopening. Six indicators for modifying stay at home order. Ability to test, protect, surge capacity, blah, 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 right? But what about the concept of essentiality? More things becoming essential. We talked about how essential the definition depends on different factors is modified by different factors. It changes over time. Where does he say more things will become essential? As we know, they should Look at the hospital trend lines. Wasn't it about flattening the curve? It seems like we've done a pretty good job. 
Well, but now, you see this photo of the beach? Southern California has been worse hit than the Bay Area. A lot of people went to the beach. They're sick and tired of this. I talked to my friend recently. She says she's been so good not going out. But she's thinking she's done. She recently went and visited a friend, driving hours away. She gave her a hug. The thing you don't know, as I mentioned before, is how people respond. But once you know how they respond, you could change your behavior. Governor Newsom thought California was better than this. That's Florida. But no. It happened here too. And what did he do? He shut down the beaches. Is that the right way? Let me take you on an aside. Let's talk about something I've been through growing up that younger people may not. But it's the development of safety in vehicles. I remember when I was younger that we didn't like wearing seatbelts in the car. I mean, we would even sit in the back in the trunk of our station wagon because they were a thing back then. It was cool. It was fun as a little kid squishing the back. You were so free, you could move around. And then we had to wear seatbelts, and we all hated it. But now it's normal, it's fine to wear seatbelts. I don't mind it. But it didn't happen right away. If you look at the timeline, the law was first passed in 1986. But it wasn't a primary offense until 1993. Meaning that they could only ticket you for not having your seatbelt on if they had another reason for pulling you over. I think that was when my family really started wearing seatbelts. It's a safety thing. I don't think any of us deny that. But we don't improve safety overnight. So first you have the seatbelt. And then you discover that, ah, uh, it's probably better to have a harness like a shoulder belt than just a lap belt that may actually be more dangerous give you internal organ damage but how come we don't have racing harnesses aren't they more safe we're a lot safer than we were 20 years ago but it didn't happen overnight it happens slowly because changing behavior is not that easy we change it slowly airbags when i was growing up they weren't standard now every car has them we're safer no doubt but we weren't safe 20 years ago, if you want to put it that way, right? If you look at cars from 20 years ago compared to cars today, there's no doubt that safety has dramatically improved. But the question is, was it not safe back then? How did people still go out? How did people still drive locally with long road trips too? Wow. With that in mind, let's go back to the roadmap. Be part of the solution. Stay home. Practice social distancing. It feels like nothing you can really do. Not really in charge of whether California reopens or not. You've done so well and you have no reward. Is that how people feel? My thought is people will do what they do. There's a mutiny on the plane. They're kept on the, on the plane for hours. There's been many cases when people get upset. They can't handle it anymore. Why don't they get let off? The flight attendants just say this or that. The captain says this. But you know, they're basically all lies. They say... They're working on it. Who knows whether they're actually working on it. Some people call 911 to get rescued. It gets important to go back and define essential. To talk about why things are essential. To talk about how the definition of essential will change. How knowledge is important for learning more about the virus. How to prevent its spread. How to prevent other people from getting sick. Who is at risk? Who is not? I think lastly, the most important thing is knowing how people respond and how that modifies what you do. You have to react to how they react. It's the most important thing. And that's one thing I would say hasn't really changed. All this is good and well, these plans. We have flattened the curve. There is no doubt about that on the West Coast. We have the capacity for treating patients. Not to say that we have good treatments, but we have the capacity for treating them the same we did two months ago. People have done a good job on the West Coast. Where is their reward now? They've done their part. Part of it is explaining, transparency, saying what's going on. Part of it is a compromise. Safety is not absolute, as we saw in the example of the seatbelt. It changes gradually over time. Yes, it's not entirely safe for us to reopen, but people are sick of it, and they're going to, quote, reopen anyways. How do we compromise? And I'll finish off with a task that should be completely fine in any situation, hiking in Lufutin.